Greetings, members and industry stakeholders. Great to see you this morning and uh, welcome to our ECA Owners Forum live panel. My name is John McNichol, ECA Executive Director, and it's a pleasure to be your facilitator this morning. Today, we're pleased to have over 100 members and stakeholders on the line with us in attendance, uh, all in the comfort of your own home or offices. Uh, unusual times, we know. We, uh, we hope you find today's conversation engaging. And uh, there's just a few things I want to explain before we begin. First of all, for the duration of the session, uh, you'll be muted with your video off. Should you wish to interact with the session, we ask you to use the chat function found at the bottom of your Zoom window. There you can write comments and inter interact with all our uh, fellow attendees. That would be great. Should you wish to ask a question in the event, and we'd love that, we ask you to use the Q&A function found at the bottom right of the Zoom window, and I'll make every effort to uh, ask as many questions as possible during the program, and I have some support from uh, Matt and Johnny Bielta at our uh, office, and, and they'll be uh, helping me manage that, so I appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to introduce our panel for the day. First, I'll introduce Andrew Sharman. Very pleased to introduce you, Andrew. He's VP Facilities and Operations at the University of Alberta lovely picture of the Dent Farm behind him. Uh, he has a long history in public leadership and procurement. He is also an ECA board vice chair. And this year he's the chair of our ECA Owners Forum, a group he helped to initiate three years ago. He's also uh, become a trusted friend and colleague. Andrew, it's a pleasure to have you here this morning. Thanks, John. Good morning. Uh, next, I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Chris Wright. Chris is Managing Director of Infrastructure for Edmonton Public Schools. Uh, in that role, Chris provides leadership in the maintenance and construction of all infrastructure throughout the region. Chris has been part of the Owners Forum leadership team for three years, and he's an exceptional cyclist. Not everybody would know that, Chris. Uh, finally, I'm pleased to introduce Jesse Bamford. Jesse is uh, Acting Branch Manager, Infrastructure Delivery at the City of Edmonton. Jesse's had several leadership roles at the City of Edmonton. Before his time at the city, he worked as a project coordinator and later project manager at sub, several local prominent GCs. Jesse is also part of our Owners Forum leadership team where he provides strong leadership. Jesse, pleasure to have you here and to see some of the art from your family on, a, on the wall behind you. Uh, thank you for bringing that. Uh, welcome everyone. I look forward to the next 50 minutes of discussion. So uh, let's get started. So the first thing we're going to discuss is managing risk amidst the COVID-19 um, in the construction cycle. And for you as owners, um, how is risk impacted uh, and been impacted by the COVID-19? Uh, Jesse, you want to hit it? Sure. Um, I'll jump off. So. Risk is managed um, very similar ways um, any element or any issue on a project. Um, it goes into, you sit there, you talk about it and say, what's the probability of the impact? What is the likelihood? Well, the probability likelihood of this item is uh, very much. Um, so we, we meet with our vendors, consultants, contractors, and walk through what is the solution to mitigate this and how do, how do we make sure that we can continue in a safe and efficient manner? Uh, anything you guys want to add? John, I'd just add that I think it's meant that we've got to uh, be much closer um, as, a, as a team. And I'm, I'm not just talking the owner's team, it's the entire team on the project. Um, probably where we've been talking of wanting to get. Uh, and we've got to keep communication going because we need to manage whatever risk comes up. It's all unknown at the right place and in, um, at the right time. And Chris, how do you guys, uh, just a few intro words there. Yeah, thanks very much. And, and I sure appreciate the comments of my uh, two panel colleagues. Uh, around that need to uh, uh, look at things and, and keep that communication going. Uh, communities of practice, even uh, such as this, John, thanks very much for hosting us today. It's a, a great thing, as Andrew says, to, you know, to uh, uh, inter interact with industry. Uh, we're going to have to keep these communities of practice going and keep this collaboration and discussion going um, because it's, it's going to be a, some complex navigation over the next little while, for sure. 
Yeah, I, I think uh, from my perspective, each of you have to handle uh, great complexity. There's admin politics for your interior spaces where you got all your staff and different levels. Then you got the politics above you, whatever that would be. Uh, then you have uh, the contracts, uh, the actual, and then the environment changing so much because of COVID and the risk management, the safety, the the changes, the money management, like there is a great complexity to it. And, uh, you know, we appreciate that each of you is handling that um, and those challenges. Um, how has the remote part seemed to have affected uh, all of this just in, in your work? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's been challenging and there was an interesting article um, yesterday, I think it was in uh, CBC about Zoom fatigue. Um, yeah. That it is, I think people are actually working longer hours, harder, because you don't get, a, you, there's no time to move between meetings, it's a click. Um, but it has meant a change in how we do business, you know, from uh, doing site meetings remotely to, um, to sharing more electronically. Although, you know, if we're going to move more into an electronic world through BIM and, uh, and other pieces, you know, it, perhaps it's an opportunity to learn from this forced move remotely. Um, to uh, some of the municipalities delivering inspections through cameras, um, so I think uh, yeah. I think it's given us some some opportunities to advance quickly, but it's brought some challenges. Well, the whole industry is concerned about risk, and a, a lot of uh, the questioning, and particularly contractors, are a little anxious to say who you know who owns the risk, and how do we uh, spread that out appropriately. Can you guys make some comments on that and try and help our people understand just uh, you know where the risk resides and so you know I'll take a stab at that um, that's always a challenge it doesn't matter what project you are on um, when we go through the planning stage and we go out for uh, tendering on that it's it's a lot of work of saying we understand what this risk is do we want to sell that risk or do we want to hold that risk um, and, and there's not one set formula um, and the biggest thing is how do we work with our partners in the industry to manage that and to understand okay who's holding it um, and at what point do we need to can we say we can release that or we've managed it and can move on uh, to yeah. me, the biggest thing is communication. The uh, force majeure is an unknown uh, catastrophe, and there is uh, elements of that written in our contracts, but there's been a, a fair amount of confusion um, to say, well, once, once the force majeure has happened and it's a known entity, does it still register as a force majeure, and how will these things be handed in, handled in contracts? So. There's a lot of uh, confusion. Uh, any comments on the project language, uh, contract language particularly, and how um, industry is kind of dealing with that? You know, I, John, I think um, there have been uncertainties for a while, and, and COVID's one of them. If you go back, what, 18 months with the uh, aluminum tariffs, the drywall tariffs all coming out of the U.S., they've had impacts mid-project. <laughs> Uh, the, the drywall ones probably go back four years. Um, you know, who knows what's next? We, we've seen through COVID that, uh, you know, our friends to the south uh, stopped sending N95 masks from 3M. Who knows what will happen with steel or anything else? So, I, I, you yeah. know, we, li we live that uncertain world constantly. COVID's brought a, probably a narrower focus from a health perspective. Um, you know, I think we've all got to share the risk. Um, I'll be blunt, I'm not gonna write a blank check. I can't, I don't have the money. I don't think any of us do as public owners nor, nor private owners. Um, but at the end of the day, if costs are unforeseen, we're gonna to have to suck some of them up, but I think there has to be give and take. Um, there are projects that are going on where actually we're, we're ahead because there've been so few people around that projects are ahead of schedule, <laughs> probably costs have come down to, to some extent. But I accept, you know, that PPE costs probably have gone up in others. So we've got to communicate. There's got to be some give and take. We've, as Jesse said, we have to manage, like any any time and any space, manage the risk appropriately uh, yeah. at the right 
time with the appropriate person. Um, COVID's just thrown us a different curveball and who knows what's coming. In my understanding, the contracts have uh, sort of stayed stable. As you've mentioned, Andrew, there are a lot of risks that have always been present in life and realities and uh, COVID, although it's a hundred year event, they say, uh, it, it's still very similar to other unpredictable things and was within the contract. But I'd like to commend the city they did take time to write what was called a comfort letter to just explain, yeah, we understand this, we see it in this form, it's not gonna have a complete change of contracts or new language, but we do understand and we will be reasonable. So I think uh, those things were helpful. Thank you, uh, Jesse and City, for that. Chris, you were gonna say something. I was just gonna say, yeah, and I appreciate uh, your comments about the city's efforts too. I mean, it's, uh, everybody under, understands that some clarity and some stability is exactly what industry uh, and owners need. And, and I think that what, uh, you know, Andrew's point is really well taken. There's always been risk. What COVID's done is it's helped to highlight, you know, the discussion about how can traditional contract language that we all lean on and, and rely on for clarity, um, you know, but, but sort of starts to dabble in zero sum worlds kind of thing, deal with something that's as unknown as a, a worldwide pandemic, right? And so, um, I go back to your comments, John, about how uh, public owners are um, governed and, and how they're funded. There's a ton of layers. And, you know, as Andrew says, it's really tough to come in with some sort of uh, global approach. Uh, that's not to be obtuse. It just is a real challenge. Um, I think, you know, again, I go back to panels and, and groups like ECA are really critical. We know that there's uh, professionals out in industry. Uh, we're going to look to them as well for advice and direction on what they see, but it, it, it is really tough to come up with a one size uh, fits all. Um, it's not a zero sum world we're living in, A or B, yes or no. Uh, and it's gonna be a challenge, um, but understand the anxiety. Absolutely, we share it. Yeah. Uh, do you think pro project procurement will change as we move forward from this time? Have we learned anything? Is there any changes that you see that will be permanent? Just trying to find my unmute button here. Um, changes, uh, a lot of a digital. You're gonna see a lot of the digital world um, happening. Um, for me, I think that's the, the biggest thing. Uh, from a procurement model, that's a conversation that's talked about from the, for the longest time, COVID related or not, that's always been a conversation. What's the most appropriate way to uh, procure this? What's the most appropriate way uh, appropriate model and at what time do we bring in certain uh, partners in the industry that's it, it's no different with any project that we look at and the uh, we we appreciate again uh, the city has made some efforts to do uh, some video inspections uh, you know, almost uh, FaceTime you know walk through with your person but not be present and some of that has been awesome for uh, speeding up process and, and anic productivity as well, the um, zoning meetings and appeal meetings, our people were just freaked out thinking these projects are gonna be put on hold because there was a, an initial announcement to say, we won't be able to have any of these public meetings until say October or November or something like that. So all our people who are waiting for an approval thought that their construction was gonna miss this whole construction season. And then uh, these meetings were held online in a Zoom meeting and more people were able to participate because when you're at work, and you've got to go to a zoning meeting, you've got to take the day off, you've got to drive downtown, you've got to park. Whereas in this case, people could just uh, join the call as they are now, uh, be a part of it, hear what they want, and then uh, get out. And the, the participation was up, the speed and process of it. There was some sacrifice even made by counselors. Anyway, we appreciate all of that, and uh, the city did a great job. It's funny you talk about the um, like that meeting, and uh, I think, this COVID has been very much a, um, a launching point or a catalyst of how do we do business? We've always had this technology, but now it's made us look or uh, force us to think outside of the box and how do we react? I sat in a meeting yesterday, um, which typically would have been very difficult to a book. And there was over 150 people in, the, in attendance. And to find a room in the city of Edmonton to book and have everybody there, well, the meeting took place. I think there was four people in a, a major room and over 150 people uh, 
participative. When we look at um, site, uh, mandatory site visits or walkthroughs and during the bid time, you know, there may be opportunity to do this remotely uh, through, uh, through this virtual environment. Uh, you talked about like doing inspections, you know, that anecdotally that uh, we, we could be doing that even on a site walkabout, you know, wearing that body cam and saying, this is what we're looking at. Um, and is there any questions as we're going, uh, as we're walking about? It, it just creates a totally open environment and accessibility for those that may not have been able to attend at that, at that moment, physically driving out there, but wanted to join. So it, it, there's a lot of opportunities. And when Andrew was talking earlier about efficiencies, you know, right off the hop, we saw force majeure letters come in and uh, statements of, you know, over 30 days, and this is three days in, over 30 days. And that same project I'm looking at right now is now three weeks ahead of schedule. And so we're seeing flip side of what's happening where there thought there was going to be a huge impact. We're seeing, oh, wow, yeah. you know, we're actually able to make uh, work on site more efficient. There's less traffic, uh, you know, the off hours or non-peak yeah. hours to do work it's it's there's some surprises some yeah. surprises it's not all bad news yeah Let's it's talk, a, guys on a new, new section here construction project issues uh on site so what are what are some site issues uh schedule delays productivity supply chain like uh wh what are you seeing with some of your projects uh, that what are the covid issues on site um, so, I mean, we've got a couple of large projects. Yes, in an enclosed space, it's caused some scheduling, uh, let's call them challenges, but people have worked around them and probably there was a bit of a pause early on. Um, I mean, COVID came on the back of a real cold spell where we lost about a week just over a piling because it was just too brutally cold. Um, but no, I think there's so little activity around some of our sites um, in some of our buildings that we're able to advance some projects quickly that otherwise we'd have had to have waited till later in the year but obviously where people are working closer than two meters it's me meant a shift to people having to learn to wear masks um, and watch their uh, their hygiene um, just different ways of trying to achieve the same outcome yeah. You know, John, I'll, I'll jump in here that uh, we've seen everything that Andrew and Jesse uh, talk about on our sites and, and certainly, and I'm going to sort of smush a little bit of procurement and an on-site that we see in the delivery model. But, um, you know, I, I do want to make a comment about some of the value that we've seen in this sort of shared uh, responsibility sh and, and contractual obligation to collaborate in our IPD delivery model. It really has worked well in instances like this as, as Andrew said, we see some initial, you know, the first few weeks of COVID, everybody, there's initial shock, there's initial questioning about what it looks like, there's initial response, there's, you know, some, uh, some anxiety for sure. Um, what our IPD teams have been able to do, though, is get together, there's a ton of transparency, obviously, in a poly party contract and a, and a ton of trust uh, in the big room. We've certainly moved those big rooms and those design efforts to a virtual environment, as we've talked about before. But it's really worked well to grapple with some of that uncertainty and uh, keep your eye on the prize a little bit. Uh, the projects have moved forward. We haven't seen big schedule delays at this point. And that sort of coming together of industry experts and, and the ownership yeah. team really has helped sort of get over that piece. Uh, again, none of it's been um, you know, on the back of a clause necessarily within our contract, right? So, yeah. Chris, you and your team, uh, Edmonton Public Schools, have done a great job in uh, uh, executing IPD projects and you really set a pace for the province and we just want to thank you for uh, leading ahead there you know the surety industry just announced that both uh, you know bonding and insurance are now products that, that are available to support IPD projects so uh, that should strengthen things but thanks for all that you're doing there appreciate your comments John I'd be remiss if I didn't thank industry and and uh, you know the, the construct like ECA for featuring some of that stuff and certainly our board for, you know, having um, um, the confidence to move forward with this uh, and the backing of uh, the province on those projects. So it, it was a shared thing, but thanks very much for your comments. Now, Appreciate to be clear to our membership out there, the ECA officially supports every procurement method. So as you know, the golden rule, those with the gold rule.
So if they say we're procuring like this, then we respond and say, okay, we'll be doing that. If you do IPD, we'll do it. If you do any of the delivery models, we are in. So we are uh, sort of agnostic, if you like, but we do support collaboration in every way. And on all the models, we want high, high levels of professionalism, collaboration, et cetera. And uh, we appreciate the progress that all of you are helping us make. Uh, what about uh, supply chain? How has COVID affected the supply chain? Anybody getting hit with bombs from that? John, I've, I've not heard of anything on our um, sites so far. Um, I know with uh, California being was in lockdown, paint was in short supply because I couldn't get any to do some decorating, but it got me out of some work at home. Well, uh, that's always good. That's. But uh, no, I, I mean, th there were concerns early on, but I've not heard of anything, but I'm maybe too far away, but, I, but I've certainly not heard of anything major. Yeah. How about yeah. you guys? Yeah, very similar to what Andrew had said. Um, holistically, not a huge item. I do know a couple of sites where uh, there was an impact, um, but the thing is, it's how do we communicate it uh, and how the timeliness of it? Uh, where does it sit on the schedule? So for this project specifically, it was some panels to go with in the facility, um, and it was coming out of a warehouse that had shut down uh, due to the pandemic. And uh, it's working with the contractor, okay, and the consultant, what areas can we continue to advance and uh, leave this area? And when is the schedule to come in? It's, it's just working with the team and how do we fit it in uh, to make sure it's still a, a, an efficient and smooth transition. Um, ultimately, when those issues arise, no different than any of our projects, if, if there is a issue with a piece of material that's the equal or alternate um, look at it, and, and does this fit? You know, there's always other options out there, and it's talking yeah. about with our with our teams. Can we can we do this a different way? Our our gang are always anxious about cash. Our, our GCs, contractors, subcontractors, is, there, is the money flow the same, or has there been some impact that's really slowed down the financial? Uh, flow and and what are the repercussions of this COVID thing in terms of uh, getting paid? What can you guys do to reassure our people? John, I mean, you know, outside, um, I think that early days where people were just at home, I think, you know, people are monitoring project uh, completion or progress, signing off on it. We've certainly got finance staff available remotely to pay. You know, and as long as we've got all the sign off pieces from, you know, engineering, architectural, etc. As I said, outside those first week or two, um, I, I think it's flowing. Um, you know, people are in or remotely um, mm -hmm. pay bills. So I don't believe there's an issue. Um, not heard of anything in the industry so far. And I can say, John, that, you know, as a group of preferred owners that want to work with industry if that's a piece of uh, uh if that's a challenge that you know our industry partners are experiencing or hearing about that's something that we're going to want to know about because that's an important piece to keep moving that's something that we can keep moving uh you know uh, with all of the qualifications that andrew talks about but we need to keep that piece going that's a piece of support we can provide industry yeah. at this point, right so well in the change and what's going on the, the crisis so to speak it it provides so many little windows for additional anxiety and it, it doesn't always make sense. It's an emotion, right? You just think, well, what? Maybe we won't get paid. Maybe they'll. Maybe they won't have people working. Maybe everything will slow down. And then if you're on a schedule for payment for your people, you just you just worry sometimes uh, unnecessarily, but also because of uh, your protectionism and your desire to manage things well. You you just need reassurance, and I think that's why this uh, this conversation is so helpful, so everyone can realize you guys seem like the same people you were before the crisis and you're acting in many of the same ways. And uh, we don't know that till we hear it. We don't know that till we feel it. And I think uh, these things are really important. But let's look into the uh, future a little bit uh, and the present day. Um, are there opportunities that are happening because of all this COVID stuff? And what uh, is there adequate support and recognition um, of the impacts of industry uh, and do you guys see opportunities 
coming up, bubbling up uh, for us to improve as an industry and a, an entire construction community. I'll pick up on something Jesse talked about in one of his earlier answers. You know, we've all been forced into this uh, remote um, sort of environment. Um, I think there is an opportunity, as, as Jesse said, we're going to be more digital. We, you know, we, we knew that. Uh, we're going to be more integrated, Chris and the team, leaders in Edmonton and IPD. But we've got into a bad habit with email that it's all too easy to send an email. Um, and, you know, you should always read it a couple of times and sit on it before you send it. Um, would you say it in person? Perhaps, you know, there's a balance when we get back to some normality in a year or 18 months, that we need to keep some of these opportunities to rapidly have a, a video conference to clear up some issues and, and understand how we can better deliver this piece that's become a problem before it becomes a contractual issue or an RFI. Mm -hmm. Let's get on the table, document it afterwards, but let's use what we've learned in this time to be better connected so we get the right outcomes for everybody. And and face to face on Zoom is, is a pretty reasonable idea. Sometimes gets rid of the travel. Gets rid of you know you can get some real speed. Let's just meet, quick discussion, get everybody on the same page. I think uh, we've been forced to learn that, and uh, I think it's an excellent learning. You know, I I just add as well that I think that um, you know I don't want to get too ethereal here, but the you know the the lens that you look at uh, what we're grappling with right now is really important as we. Uh, also work towards some uh, degree of normalcy as we've talked about if we're constantly yearning for everything to go right back like it was uh you know be careful what you return to normal on right away i think is what andrew's saying sort of thing it's going to be a challenge if you look at you know a, a parallel industries with ours other industries uh, uh, residential construction uh, those that have embraced and probably will move forward with some new realities rather than just sort of hanging on till we go back to normal sort of thing are going to be leading, I would think, the charge moving forward. That's owners, industry, you know, uh, all of the partners. And so I would embrace some folks to hang on to those pieces that they really do see as advantages and continue with them rather than just see it as a stopgap. It's, it's important yeah. in how we frame our thinking, I think, moving forward. And these are tough times. Each of you have to manage staff. And how have you managed in the some of the layoff environment and the anxieties of your staff? Um, and just the care and nurture of your people. How are you doing that? And, and uh, what are you learning? So our first and utmost priority is our people. Staff, industry partners, citizens, being safe, staying healthy. That's the first priority. And that's the very first thing that's top of our minds. Um, as far as you talked about layoffs, it's, it's a reality that doesn't matter if it's COVID related or not. Um, and, and our resources, our people are our resources. And uh, they are the ones that help bring us, to, um, bring us to victory or bring us to the ultimate goal that we're looking to achieve. And so it's always a delicate balance, um, making sure that from a fiscal point of view, the resource point of view, um, and how do we do it together? Um, from the economic piece that you had asked on, um, how, how is this influencing? No different. It's always one of those things that you're always watching, looking at, and what's the right balance based on today's economy, based on the current environment? How do we do this? How do we uh, get through the valleys and the peaked hills? There's times where we're, overly busy and, um, and and at the same time we don't want to over hire during that time and we want to ensure that we're able to leverage off the our industry partners how do we do this in a more efficient way so it's an ongoing thing covid related or not it's one of those things that always happens as part of a business yeah some of our industry in discussion with city leadership have sometimes said uh, in project management and other parts of construction we've thought it might be sensible at times for the city to hire in a project-based way so that when things are slow, uh, you might have um, some flexibility, but we'll see what, what evolves. Um, how about your management of staff and their anxiety? Uh, Andrew, how, how are you doing with your people? I know you've got such challenges. Well, I mean, we very quickly went to suspend classes to protect, you know, as Jesse said, staff, 
um, faculty, students, the community yeah. to interface with. And I've got a lot of frontline staff that have uh, had to remain on the job, like uh, Jesse and the city. Um, so we, we've worked with them, looked at safety protocols, um, you know, provision of PPE where needed, uh, and just being out. That's why I spend you know, virtually all my days uh, on campus with a couple of my senior leaders. Uh, I was out and about on work sites the last couple of days, uh, both with contractors and with our, our trades and our grounds team, our janitorial, just reassuring them. And the fact that you're out and about, um, I've gone to video messaging rather than written just to try and get some personal touch. It's tough. And, uh, you know, we've made a number of permanent layoffs and a significant number of temporary layoffs. So trying to keep connected with the team. We've just launched an intranet site to to try and pe keep people connected. You've got to go above and beyond. It's their uncertain. Yeah. Andrew, I know you're in touch with students in a very special way and that you have children. Your two daughters are at a university age, as are a couple of my kids. And uh, that gives you an extra awareness of what the student side is. And I know that's, that adds uh, a color, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, you get to understand, I've got one at UBC and one at U of A, and you get to understand their, how they've dealt with online learning. Um, it's not, it's, they're not fans of it. But we've yeah. had to go predominantly that way again in the fall, as is a lot of the world. Um, so, yeah, it, it's tough. We've got to try and step up. We've got to try and provide them with the best quality we can. Um, we've got to prevent um, our staff our stu and our faculty from getting ill because we've got to sustain this. I honestly don't see us getting back to any form of normality before the fall of next year at the absolute earliest. And it still won't be the January of 2020 normality. Now, some are in shock, Andrew, because they, they have this hope that it's all going to change in about two weeks when we get uh, to the next stage. Um, well, can, you, can you help us understand why you'd have such a long-term window there? Well, I, I mean, I'm very close to it because I'm leading the, uh, our response at the university. But if you look at public health guidelines and their concerns for the influenza season, they have been quite clear that when we get to influenza season, it's going to sit under the surface through the summer and there'll be little outbreaks. And, uh, you know, if you've read the world media today, you'll see that South Korea are locking down again. They've had some spikes. It'll just bubble along because of the heat. But when we hit influenza, they'll treat any cold-like symptom as COVID until clinically proven otherwise. We have to protect, um, as the province have done so far, our clinical capability, particularly ICUs. So that's mm. going to mean still limited face-to-face -face interaction. We're not going to be sat shoulder to shoulder at Roger's place anytime soon. Um, we've got to wait for that vaccine. And um, then we've got to see what the uptake on the vaccine is. So we, the only way we'll get a herd immunity is through vaccine. It's not going to happen through people getting ill. Um, so sadly, we're in this for the long haul, but we've got to get our economy back online. It's that fine balance, um, and it's tough times for everybody. Hmm. Well, uh, Chris, thank you, Andrew. It is, it is tough, and we appreciate you and others in their leadership of trying to figure out uh, how to manage it all, and we realize that it's stressful. but. Chris, what keeps you up at night? And, uh, you know, uh, how can we as industry support some of the challenges that you have? So that's a double, double sided question. What, yeah. what, what's tough in your world? So thanks very much. And, and like Andrew, sort of at the front end of some discussions on our jurisdiction side around what September looks like. And so I know I'm probably speaking to a lot of parents out there. Um, uh, that are attending today, and we recognize the role of K-12 instruction in part of what Andrew's talking about, about getting the province back on its feet, industry back on its feet. And so I'm wearing that hat as well, managing a little grade seven science today while we do this dial in as well at home. Uh, and so, you know, working through symbiotic relationships right now and that sort of thing on the side. Uh, so totally appreciate where everybody's at. Um, and so we're handling that discussion as a jurisdiction and we're engaging with the province on the scenarios that the province has put about what a return to K-12 instruction looks like in, in the fall. And, you know, as a result of all of that, there's additional layers of uncertainty and we, we understand that we're, we're really trying to be uh, um, um, 
you know, transparent. We're engaging parents in that discussion. We've had unprecedented feedback on some of the engagement efforts that we've done with our parents on that piece. And so, but yeah. like Andrew, you know, I think that when you're managing um, um, ministry input, you're managing health guidelines, you're managing parent expectations, you're managing the reality of what, you know, you're able to provide uh, and how you're able to support it. It does mean that it is a complex discussion and the result uh, is uh, you know like our industry friends are feeling that there's some uncertainty and I really do empathize with industries uh, leaders that have had to experience some of what Andrew and Jesse and I've had to experience on the public sector side uh, in the form of layoffs and that sort of thing it is a tough discussion what we've had to continue to focus on with our team though is listening and being available because you can't provide a whole bunch of certainty or a whole bunch of don't worry you know so it really has been a, an exercise in managing some of that anxiety that you have to realize is out there and you have to listen a lot. Um, and so we're just trying to do that with our staff. We have a full maintenance complement like Andrew does of, of in-house teams that we're trying to also make sure are in safe environments out in schools that are still from that perspective operational. We're not offering K to 12 instruction, obviously. So we're trying to manage school staff and our maintenance staff and make sure that we're communicating and clear so that people aren't in situations they feel uncomfortable about yeah um, so we understand very challenging for the whole community the teachers the kids everyone uh, struggling parents having to teach science at home uh revenue from taxes is declining says mahmoud uh due to missing jobs and increase in unemployment rate is a global issue how would this affect spending on public infrastructure what can be done to mitigate this issue? Just the lowering of finances that are available uh, in an economic decline. Well, what will happen with all the infrastructure that is needed for the city, the U of A, for the schools? What do you foresee? Hmm. Um, maybe I'll take a stab at this. Um... So in uh, 2018, uh, we had our um, our budget, so what we call it a capital budget and operating budget, where we go through and review. Uh, from the capital side, there's about $7.4 billion worth of work that's on the books, um, and right now over 300 plus projects. I, I think if you've been tuning in some of the council uh, meetings that have been happening, I think there's a strong focus on what is nice to have versus what is the need to have. And the, the important thing or the in focus is a lot about ensuring that our assets that we have, that we own and operate continue to be well maintained, that they're able to be there for the enjoyment of our citizens going forward. And that renewal piece, that, that making sure that if there's renewal required into it, that we're taking care of those assets. And I think there's a lot of focus around that. Um, and that'll that'll continue. Uh, that'll continue to be probably one of the biggest focus is going forward. The uh, the shiny, the new uh, items are more of well, it, is this is what we need today? You know, I do. It does fit within the master plan of where we're wanting to go, uh, but is this where we want to focus at this point? And so a lot of the priority, and we have a lot at the city of Edmonton, a lot of renewal work. Uh, you know, if I look at facilities alone, we have over 900 facilities that we own and operate, and uh, they they have a life expectancy, a lifespan. And if we want to continue to have those assets, no different than your house at home, you got to maintain it and you got to freshen it, and and make sure that the program fits with the current environment. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I, and with less money sometimes. No, I, I think uh, a little bit like Jesse, for the last two years, the university has certainly been on a, a review and a, a move to better use of what we've got. Functional renewal, uh, renovation, functional upgrades. I really think that given the, you know, not just the province, the country, the world's challenges, that I think new is going to be the exception where it truly is needed. It'll probably be more a replacement rather than an expansion. Um, it's, it's a challenge and we have to be careful. We want some stimulus funding for the industry, but it's how we do it so that our grandchildren, our great grandchildren are not on the hook for paying it off for decades and decades to come. It's such a fine balance. Yeah. And, and I don't know that it gets it, 
you know, any easier moving forward? It's a great question. Uh, uh, there is no doubt that the back end of a conversation, at, you know, around deferred maintenance, we would have, you know, close to a billion dollars in deferred maintenance as a jurisdiction. Without some capital investment, it's going to be a challenge at some point. And Edmonton doesn't stop growing, especially in student population. Um, and so we've seen, you know, we've probably built two dozen schools in the last 10 years, and we're still 15% higher utilization than we were. We're over 80% now utilized. So this is a, you know, um, in addition to stimulus spending, it's, it's one that we're going to have to continue to talk about with the province, our funding partner. Um, but, you know, uh, this is a huge challenge, I'm sure, for, for all funding, you know, sources, uh, provincially and federally. Huge. And we're going to get the bubble out of Chris's uh, shop in the next few years. There's a, there's a massive bubble coming through. Uh, and there was some media the other day with our president-elect, Bill Flanagan, saying by 2025, we want to see probably 10,000 more students at the U of A. There's already a shortage of places in Alberta at post-secondary. Um, it, it's a challenge. We've got to try and do more with what we've got and, and, and work with industry to how can we make our facilities more flexible and adaptable for the long term. Um, and, and I saw a question from Jeff Robinson, and I think, you know, that's one of the key bits is keeping our facilities relevant, but also keeping them with surfaces that are easy to keep hygienic because we're seeing super bugs and more and more of the we had H, we had SARS, H1M1 and, and now COVID all within 17, 16 years. Is this the new norm? So we've got to adapt the type of facilities and the surfaces um, and give them longevity, but make them easier to um, to upgrade or change. Um, and we've got to be more ecologically aware. And you and you're uh, thinking about that and requiring it of your future buildings, uh, a different approach to design then, Andrew. Yeah, I think so. You know, you picked up on it, the dentistry pharmacy project that uh, the artist's impression behind us. One of the key pieces for that building is, you know, it's the, the piece that we're keeping is 1922. But I want another 100 years life out of that building. So we have to keep it adaptable and flexible and relevant. Um, because who knows what the student of 2050 is going to demand. Uh, the student of, 20, of 1950 won't recognize the university today. And I guess that'll be even bigger in 2050. Great. Um, well, what, what about lessons learned from uh, working with industry and things that you think, is there a new future? Do you guys have dreams to say, look, this is where I think we should go. You get to, to be in charge for this part of the discussion. And imagine you're uh, you're somehow king of the world, king of construction. What what do you want to see? What are you hoping for when you say, "I see a new future. I'd like it to be like this." Can you draw that out for us? Future looking forward, um, a collaborative environment. And I think that that is key, um, and that's you know what this is here right now. Um, at ECA, John, we have that owners forum, and uh, I think that alone started off uh, for me from that collaborative environment, working with Andrew on that that BIM modeling. What does that look like, and how do we start to leverage some of those lessons learned? Chris, when you talked about the IPD, immediately we were in there asking, "Okay, how are you doing this?" We haven't done one, so we were looking to pilot one. What are the lessons learned? How do you approach that? Um, so what does it look like in the future? It's that collaborative environment, that ability to have this open discussion, to have that conversation uh, with our vendors, with the industry, and leverage off the experience of each other. It's not the, you know, knowledge is power and we're going to hold those cards to our chest. It's how yeah. do I share that information? What kind of legacy do I leave behind? And, and that, that ripple effect, that the, the wave or the weight. Yeah, that, yeah that, and our, con our constructors... They want to believe you that you want to collaborate and that you're interested in that, but they sometimes are confused because the machine with its complexities of politics and departments and everything for, for each of you as institutional big, big groups, um, they, they just, they feel your frustration sometimes, they feel their own frustration, and they're thinking, how do we get collaborative when we got these you know things that just grind with gears that sometimes get jammed do you have suggestions for 
giving those people some hope that it you know, will actually become better and better. So, I mean, we've, we, all three of us have different governance protocols and we're all to some extent um, have to uh, adhere to provincial and federal legislation. You know, we've got trade yeah. agreements, Financial Administration Act in Alberta. Um, but putting those aside, you know, as Jesse said, it's, it's getting the right people engaged early to help guide owners. Um, you know, the days of, um, you know, we'll put this out and someone will come and build it just because we put it out shouldn't occur. We need to be guided. Um, we need to stop building palaces that we don't think about the, um, the, the total cost of ownership. Um, and, and if we're going to get down to more efficient use of our limited monies, we need that expertise that industry has to help us and guide us as we scope a project at the start, um, whilst we can protect them so they can still bid. Because I know there'll be nervousness that, um, that that will preclude them. And I think the U of A have done a reasonably good job the last few years of, uh, of, of bringing people in to scope things out and then still being able to have them bid on projects. Um, yeah value that expertise that's where we need industry's input and we need to be challenged by industry as well if we're off mark um don't be afraid that um you know if we're out to lunch tell us and help us get it back on track because at the end yeah. of the day we all want a win-win project i want a good well, project a good um building that i can operate for years to come a designer wants to have something they're very proud of construction and want to be proud of the outcome you know everybody's got the same uh, successful outcome but just in a different perspective absolutely and uh, i personally know each of you and the efforts you make to be collaborative and i appreciate that and i want to on behalf of industry push and and ask you to continue to push your organization or um, move it towards becoming more collaborative, more communicative, more open, more honest, more, uh, more uh, vulnerable, really, to admit things and to sort of realign the power structures of the organization to help us all become really healthy human beings. And sometimes the institutional pressures almost affirm um, the wrong things accidentally. And, and, I, and I know that each of you have leadership that you're exerting to change these things. And so we wanna, as Andrew said, you know, maybe industry can help push us. So on behalf of our industry, I wanna push you in that direction. Uh, no whip, just, just a, a friendly push. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, any other comments you wanted to add, you guys, on that? No, I just, you know, you, I'll, I'll jump in for a sec, John, and I think uh, notwithstanding uh, governance and funding and, and, and some pieces that certainly are uh, in the interest, I would say, of public stakeholders, um, uh, uh, a couple of layers and, and very transparent, and there's, there's also some, you know, some security of stakeholders on how public infrastructure is being built and how public dollars are being spent. Uh, but, you know, the ability to also move quick and pivot um, I would point to some of the success that we've had, as Andrew points out, through the ECA, uh, you know, uh, that includes industry at the table talking with us about, uh, you know, uh, best delivery models and vendor valuation and, and pieces like that. So I think we have demonstrated the manner in which we, uh, uh, we are trying to close uh, some of those communication gaps and, and, and work in partnership with the experts that are in the field uh, uh, running really important foundational companies, private stakeholders. Uh, this is good input that they're giving us, and we do appreciate it, and, and we are trying to work um, with some responsive, um, um, quick pivot uh, action on some of these things. Mm. Yeah, so. Great. Yeah. And it, the opportunities that ECA has helped us move, if you look at this year before we hit COVID, we had a great workshop on risk with a whole load of owners and different levels of industry, risk managers, insurers, legal um we then did the uh, the dive into two projects the the with bim with uh, you know next and the new aup headquarters and dent farm fantastic discussion and we need to pick up on those now we're trying to get out of some of the covid focus uh, and keep moving those but thanks john and the team for helping us do that yeah um 
Um, you know, one of, one of our people, uh, Dave, is asking about, uh, you know, how are we going to make the buildings safe, uh, implementing for sites as people return, the hand washing, the PPE, social distancing. How do we handle even elevators at properties? Um, just the, the idea of the touching of the buttons and the, the possible transference. There just seem to be so many challenges with new uh, ideas about the, um, the transfer of germs, uh, virus, and what's happening in those regards, the very practical feeling of a building and making it healthy. Well, and we want people to come back eventually. Um, I mean, we're certainly in, others will be the same, uh, regular cleaning of high touch surfaces just like that we've recently put signage up to limit occupancy in elevator um, we, we're issuing a safety return to work guideline next week we've just put an e-module online to help people coming back into our spaces to understand the risks and their accountabilities we all have an accountability in this um, and it's still down to frequent hand washing and personal hygiene and if you're ill stay at home but it is it's going to be challenging um is it going to change the face of our downtown cores i think it will a little but i still don't think a lot of people will want to sit on their sofa for the rest of their careers working on a laptop um, i just think people we are humans and we interact uh, and you can only do so much in, in online but i think there's going to be a bit more of a balance yeah and i'd agree that the you know the the vulnerability in the program is around those less structured time we're seeing that in you know in our discussions around school too it's the circulation it's the it's the things outside of where i'm working in my space and so you know we're all community members that are working on those sites too and some of the practices and some of the awareness and some of the commitment that we bring to those sites is going to be a big piece of it outside of you know, the PPE that we have and the posters that we have, uh, you know, individual stakeholders as members of communities working on sites is going to be a big piece of this. So, um, our, our membership really wants to see construction spend increase. Jason Kenny wants to stimulate the economy by having lots of construction. There seems to be this idea that some of the money that's intended to flow to construction uh, should be increasing even this season's construction uh, volume. Do you see any of that money being able to move through in this construction season? Do are you going to be able to start more projects uh, from here to to winter? How does that feel to you? I'll, I'll start, John. And there has been some news lately that uh, Edmonton Public Schools and other school jurisdictions did receive some stimulus money. This is not large capital project sorts of stimulus money, but certainly yeah. the expectation that comes with the funding is that it's timely uh that it's yeah. out the door in a in a in efficient and a timely manner and uh can you do it also, can sorry? you get that money through and out the door can you get the project fired up yeah it it has to that's the expectation of the province when it comes that's our opportunity for personal growth is to make sure that that happens sort of thing and so that needs to yeah. happen and it's also you know clear that it 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 there wants to be ties with getting Alberta back to work and, and being able to document that and being able to record how that how successful that is. So that's the intent of uh, of the jurisdiction in honoring the uh, funding that we've received. And that's what we're going to be keen on. Absolutely. Our, member focus our on membership and their families will be so thankful for all the success you have with that, Chris, because as the as those projects come online, it makes a world of difference. Uh, for Alberta, for employment, for construction particularly. So uh, ahead of time, I want to thank you for the efforts that you're making to do that. Uh, at, how about you guys? You're going to get some money flowing? How's it look for you, Andrew? Um, I think it's challenging. We've got probably a two and a half year horizon on major capital. The, um, the dentistry pharmacy project uh, is still funded Touchwood and uh, renovations of the list of towers yeah. maintenance is a focus and this year we did get our infrastructure maintenance grant um, 
we have a number of shovel ready projects and and that's one of the things i think the team have been very good at uh, um, having a number of projects on the shelf so that when funding does flow federally provincially we can be opportunistic but um, it does mean that you know you have to uh, adjust your project delivery model because you're doing it in multiple phases so i'm hopeful that we'll get something. Um, I haven't seen any money flow to the post-secondary world yet. We've certainly got a need with our huge deferred maintenance liability, um, and we have a good plan. But uh, you know, let's see what the coming months bring. Yeah. Well, we're we're supportive of all three of you. I just glanced at the. I'm getting messages from Matt. I got to shut down. Sorry, Jesse. <laughs> um, but. Uh, let me say uh, on behalf of everyone on the call, thank you to Andrew, Chris, and Jesse. Uh, thanks for your enlightening and valuable uh, comments. Uh, thank you for everyone who attended, all of you who are part of our community in this discussion today. A couple final notes. Uh, we've recorded today's session and uh, we'll make that link available as soon as possible. Please note that we have two more virtual events confirmed in the calendar. The first is our YBG Ed Talks, uh, the afternoon of June 4th. And the second is our virtual Women Build event on Thursday, June 11th. These will be great events and a chance for uh, us to have a common experience. And sometimes that's uh, not as prominent as it used to be. Uh, we are also uh, likely adding uh, our, we've canceled our golf tournaments and instead are having golf days. So rather than, um networking with 144 golfers you're going to network with three golfers <laughs> so that's why we're calling them golf days but it'll still be a great opportunity maybe uh for people to take out a, a couple of clients or friends uh maybe co-workers and and just get out i mean we all need some fun so all these events are coming up uh you can find information and register on our website website uh thank you everyone uh, for your attendance today. Have a great day and uh, thanks for all your work. Thanks everyone. Thank you.